Hello, everybody. Ed Yardeni here. It's uh, March 13th, Monday, March 13th, and uh, lots, of, uh, lots of action, lot, lots of things going on that we uh, need to talk about. Um, start with the Oscars. Uh, uh, over the weekend, uh, uh, the uh, Oscars, the Academy Awards for uh, bailouts, uh, was uh, awarded to um, Janet Yellen and, uh, of course, uh, Jerome Powell. Uh, and the FDIC, uh, the, the regulators and the Treasury, uh, the Fed all came together and uh, basically uh, bailed out uh, the depositors of uh, a couple of these banks that have uh, imploded uh, over the past couple of days. Uh, they didn't uh, say that everybody's uh, deposits uh, would be uh, guaranteed insured, uh, which kind of uh, raises the uh, concern that if uh, people realize that they've got uh, more than $250,000 in an account, that um, that amount is not insured and it's uh, vulnerable. So we'll, we'll see how this uh, works in the next uh, few days, uh, what sort of responses we get from the, the public to it. But uh, I suspect that uh, the uh, fact that the regulators uh, led by the Fed have uh, com come in in this way, that uh, this bailout, this um, act by the uh, lenders of last resort uh, will uh, stabilize the situation. I, I know there's a sense of deja vu. Yes, yes, you know, uh, remember what happened during the great financial crisis, one thing would blow up and that was supposed to be the end of it. And then another thing blew up and, and so on and so forth. In the current situation, I think the, the biggest issue that uh, was sort of, uh, that suddenly has become that something, uh, you know, there's been a lot of chatter about something is gonna blow up if the Fed continues to tighten. Well, I think uh, SVB might very well be that something. Uh, the question is, does that uh, financial crisis in uh, a fairly limited segment of the uh, regional banking sector, is that uh, the, the, the event that kicks off an economy-wide uh, credit crunch and a recession? I don't think so. I'm not changing my uh, probabilities yet on um, 60, 40, 60 soft landing, 40, uh, hard landing, and you know there's variations of that. Uh, because I, I think that uh, what we're seeing here is uh, the, the Fed's uh, bringing back the punch bowl. I mean, this uh, bank lending uh, uh, facility is uh, very reminiscent of all these various emergency facilities that have been set up since the great financial crisis. There must be somebody in the basement of the Fed who just sits there all day trying to figure out uh, what kind of... Uh, alphabet soup of uh, names they can come up with for these emergency uh, facilities. And they've worked. They've worked like a charm to address illiquidity in the financial system. Um, and look, even JP Morgan's getting into the act here. They're providing liquidity uh, to, to First Republic, which seems to be the other regional bank that uh, reminds people of the SVB situation. And so it's been under a lot of pressure, but uh, JP Morgan seems to be willing to put a lot of money into them. And I guess push comes to shove, there could be some uh, uh, bank uh, mergers. Uh, I know there's some people in Congress who don't want to see any bank mergers and don't want banks to get any bigger. Uh, but uh, in a, an emergency situation, they'll, uh, they'll tolerate it. And um, so we'll see. Like I said, this is uh, just the beginning, but it doesn't have to be the, the beginning of a calamity. Uh, it could be the be beginning of uh, fixing this thing. Uh, so in some ways, uh, not only has the Fed uh, brought back the punch bowl uh, with this uh, bank uh, liquidity facility, it basically says that, you know, if you're a, a, a small bank and uh, somebody, uh, a lot of people had uh, more than 250000 in their accounts and are starting to pull it, maybe they're going into money markets, maybe they're going into other accounts at, at bigger banks, uh, whatever, you can go and basically get a one-year repo. Uh, in this uh, facility. So the deposits go, the Fed will, uh, will deposit money in your account for, uh, for, for a year. So that's, that's the way I si size it all up. Um, let's, um, let's go and look at some of these uh, charts that are relevant to uh, the events of the day. And by the way, it's kind of interesting. I think we were all uh, sort of focusing on the economic indicators this week, CPI comes out tomorrow and certainly it's going to be important and you know if it's a hotter than expected number how does that play out in the current current scenario uh, on, other, on the other hand if it turns out to be in line or um, better than expected more moderate than expected uh, that uh, would uh, 
allow the Fed to do what it needs to do right now, which is focus on financial stability. By the way, I don't think they're going to uh, be raising the Fed funds rate by 25 basis points. Remember last week, uh, the markets went from 25 basis points to 50 basis points back to 25 basis points. Uh, I'll, jo I'll, I'll join the Goldman crowd and argue that uh, given the uh, turmoil right now, the instability, the uncertainties, uh, the Fed will probably use that as an explanation, a uh, valid explanation to say, this is why they've decided to hold off and we'll revisit uh, things as, um, as necessary before the, uh, the, the May meeting. Uh, let's go to uh, share my screen. All right, so um, uh, clearly uh, addressing the uh, SVB uh, situation, uh, I wrote the um, uh, morning briefing, uh, I sent you an advanced copy yesterday at three o'clock uh, before everything uh, was uh, announced. But I did have a feeling that based on previous experiences that we've all had together, uh, that the, the Fed and the FDIC would come in and provide some sort of uh, solution. Um, so uh, figure one just shows where we are uh, with the market, where we were on Friday. Uh, we uh, had uh, last week cut through the 50 and 200 day moving averages uh, in a heartbeat. Um, first on Tuesday of last week, when Powell said that uh, he, he was he was more hawkish, and I think he was more hawkish because the Fed is data dependent, and the data that came out in February for January was stronger on the economy and hotter on inflation. Um, I think we're going to see some cooling off here in the batch of in, uh, indicators above. We've seen some cooling off in the uh, employment indicator, for example, and average uh, work week actually declined, uh, which means that uh, uh, personal income uh, on the wages side. Uh, probably wasn't all that strong during uh, February. Uh, and that could have, have an impact on slowing retail sales um, and, and so on. Um, but here we are basically back at uh, the uh, um, closing uh, level of uh, 2022. Uh, clearly we went below it in the past uh, uh, hour or so. And now I guess we're trying to figure out where the market's trying to figure out where it wants to go from here. Uh, by the way, I uh, have been in touch with uh, Joe Feshbach, um, my friend and uh, uh, a fellow with uh, as much experience as I have on the economic and uh, strategy side. He's got it on trading markets and he's done very well. And uh, he, he uses charts, but he also has a sense for the psychology of the market. And he tells me that the put call ratio is absolutely soaring. Uh, soared, uh, and um, as a result of that, uh, he's thinking that uh, the, the, that from a contrarian perspective, uh, that reduces the downside here in this particular uh, move. And he's actually looking for uh, signals to um, participate in the next rally. So I like the way he thinks. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that he's always bullish, uh, quite the opposite. He's, uh, he's very agnostic about the, the, the markets. Uh, but his message is that uh, the way the markets are trading, what he sees in the put call, um, suggests that uh, we're not going to be retesting the, the lows or making new lows in this uh, move. Uh, meanwhile, that's easy to say, uh, but the reality is uh, we had a great January, uh, which gave all of us some uh, hope that uh, may maybe some of this uh, uh, up and down action, uh, you know, uh, net neck jerking uh, action would uh, uh, come to an end, but of course not. Um, it's, I mean, we're gonna continue to be buffeted as long as uh, we have uncertainties about what the Fed's doing. Uh, I think what the uh, SVB situation did is uh, it might've increased the certainty uh, that the Fed isn't gonna be raising interest rates aggressively here and that it's, uh, it's gonna cool, cool, uh, cool off the uh, rate of increases if they go at all. I, at this point, I mean, uh, you know how easy it is to change your mind, uh, 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 my mind anyways, on a uh, regular basis here, depending on uh, all the wild uh, events that are occurring. Uh, but uh, all in all, I think that the Fed uh, is uh, uh, more likely to uh, pass on a rate hike and maybe that'll be it for a while. And that's certainly the message we're getting from the, the, the bond market and the, and the two year. Uh, with this uh, tremendous rally we've we've had in those markets, they're basically saying that um, you know this this could lead to a financial uh, contagion uh, and, and a recession, uh, and um, 
and so uh, bonds uh, are, are attractive in that scenario. Um, but even if not, um, I'm still thinking that inflation is going to be moderating. Anyways, interest rates, uh, we went straight up. Um, the economy uh, performed remarkably well despite that. And now the, uh, the bears have, uh, can, can basically said uh, they told us so, or they told me so, uh, in that um, you, you can't uh, go from a, a, a decade or more of free money and suddenly raise interest rates by 400, 500 basis points uh, without something breaking. Well, I'll, give, I'll, I'll concede that something is broken and that's uh, SVB. Question is, is this, uh, is this it? Is this the big one that ca causes a uh, credit crunch in a recession uh, or is it another one of these panic attacks? <laughs> I, I may be bringing back the panic attacks ID. We'll see how that goes. Uh, but uh, the yield curve, as I've said many times in the past, uh, has done a really good job of, of basically signaling that if the Fed keeps raising interest rates, something's going to break. Uh, and uh, again, I can see that uh, it worked this time uh, again. Um, and um, the um, what broke uh, is uh, maybe the regional banks and the issue raised is uh, insured versus uninsured deposits. Um, but um, in the past, the, uh, the financial crisis uh, that uh, was anticipated by the inverted yield curve would then lead to a credit crunch, then lead to recession. Uh, this time around, um, I'm not convinced that uh, we are in fact going to see that economy-wide uh, credit crunch and recession. And I think what the Fed and the FDIC are doing uh, increases the likelihood that uh, it will be a soft landing after all. Uh, and ask me again after the CPI and try to sort out how that uh, plays in the way the Fed manages monetary policy. Uh, but here, I guess, is uh, two charts showing the disintermediation risk. Um, when I started out my career at the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, New York, I um, shared an office with somebody else. I, uh, I wore um, uh, uh, short sleeve uh, white shirts and I, uh, I, had a, uh, I kept a, a tie in the office just in case I had to make a presentation or something like that. I didn't have a jacket. Um, but um, uh, one of my uh, first jobs uh, at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York was to uh, keep track of disintermediation and what was going on with deposits. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, we had uh, financial deregulation started and um, we had had a, a problem with disintermediation for quite some time because whenever the Fed uh, would decide that inflation is a problem, they'd raise interest rates above the interest rates that the maximum interest rates that could be put on deposits and you'd have this intermediation. Money would flow out of the intermediaries and cause a recession. Um, I don't know if that was a problem for the Fed. It was a pretty handy uh, tool for causing a recession. All you had to do was push rates up above those deposit rates, watch this intermediation, and you get a, a loans falling and the, and the economy falling. Uh, with uh, deregulation, we seem to have gotten um, less of that uh, disintermediation problem. Uh, but here again, uh, it's, it's kind of making a big bit of a comeback. This is deposited at all commercial banks. The data is available weekly. The Fed puts it out every week. We watch it. Uh, here's total banks, large banks, small bank deposits. And uh, you can see if you look at the total banks that uh, they have been coming down. I think some of that, maybe a lot of it, is actually quantitative tightening uh, as the Fed uh, uh, no longer uh, buys bonds. That has the uh, impact of reducing the money supply, particularly deposits. Um, but undoubtedly, some of that is also disintermediation, which means that if you don't like the rate that the bank is paying, uh, go elsewhere. So that's what we're seeing here in, the, in this chart. They're going to money market mutual funds and the individuals uh, certainly, I mean, it's uh, a sizable amount since the beginning of last year. It looks like, what, $400 uh, billion? This is in trillions. So we're looking at about a $400 billion increase in uh, money market mutual funds. Uh, by the way, back to this, uh, why isn't this uh, a calamity? Uh, well, uh, the pandemic, uh, we have to continue to remind ourselves the pandemic was a uh, crazy time, crazy event uh, with uh, ongoing repercussions that uh, are, are just starting to maybe sort out. But if you just extrapolate this uh, chart of uh, total deposits, you can see they were still well above what we might have been uh, if we were just looking at the pre-pandemic uh, 
uh, trend of deposits. So it's not as though there's a liquidity crisis out there uh, in terms of the money supply. There's plenty of uh, cash around. And I think we see that every now and then when the market decides it's time to rally. Uh, but the risk here is, uh, you know, we've seen uh, loan demand increase. Maybe if you put a magnifying glass on this, uh, you would see something like uh, some slowing down, but it is at an all-time uh, record high. And uh, what uh, uh, what we're seeing here is that uh, now I'm putting the total deposits on the same chart with the loans, and uh, you know something's got to give here. And what's giving is uh, securities. Uh, they are they selling securities and taking losses? No, they're probably letting them mature, and uh, that's where the source of liquidity is coming from for making loans. The uh, risk, uh, the, the the problem that happened at SVB is that um, uh, depositors kind of forced the issue on their uh, bond portfolio, forcing them to sell bonds in order to raise some uh, capital. And the whole thing was a totally botched up, messed up situation that shouldn't have uh, happened, but uh, it, it did. And now we have to uh, kind of clean up that mess. So here's that chart again of the federal funds rate. Uh, the uh, red shades are when the federal funds rate's going up. Uh, the blue shades, <coughs> Trades are when the uh, federal funds rates. Uh, I should have told you when I, before we started this. Uh, I think I told you last time that I managed at the uh, last, last Thanksgiving to get uh, COVID. Then I got RSV about a week after that, and then I got pneumonia at the beginning of the year. Now I'm working on bronchitis. I, I mean, I've never had any respiratory issues whatsoever. Uh, but maybe this COVID thing kind of made me more vulnerable. Anyways, I'm, uh, as long as I keep drinking some water, I'm fine. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're, on this uh, figure eight, we're going to have to add uh, a line for um, uh, SVB, uh, clearly, uh, as of uh, Thursday. And so that's uh, kind of a, the latest uh, panic. Um, and uh, more often than not, uh, in the past, when one of these institutions would blow up, you get the credit crunch, you get the recession. By now, you know my shtick. Um, now, let's uh, change topics just a little bit here and uh, focus on the economy. The economy is doing uh, well so far. Um, I know that everything's coming together that uh, increases uh, the likelihood of a recession in some people's minds. Uh, but I kind of look at what the Fed's doing as bringing the punch bowl back, uh, bringing the Fed put back, not the Fed put back directly for the uh, stock market, but uh, uh, more importantly, from the Fed's perspective, is financial stability in the banking se sector. And so the emergency lending uh, facility is currently a Fed put uh, for, for the uh, banks, particularly their regional banks, really any bank that uh, is facing a problem with uh, uh, people getting out of uninsured uh, deposits moving, moving elsewhere. Um, so. Here's a chart that uh, uh, actually Jerome Powell um, uh, put together in a speech, I think it was November 11th of last year to look at the demand and supply of labor. And as you can see here, uh, he, he takes the uh, labor force uh, as a supply of labor, which makes sense. And then his uh, clever innovation here is to take employment uh, and the job openings and say, that's the demand for labor. And then we could take the difference here and you can see that there certainly has been an unprecedented demand uh, for labor. Um, now, everybody's been kind of focusing on the supply of labor. It's like, we all know that the pandemic uh, reduced the supply for various reasons. We know that the baby boomers are retiring. Uh, we know that uh, people are quitting their jobs more often and taking a break and then coming back. Um, and so we, we, we know we have quite a few theories about uh, what's going on on the um, uh, supply side. Uh, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't see too many people focusing on the demand side. And uh, I think this is relevant for thinking about what the Fed's been trying to do. The Fed's been trying to raise interest rates to cool off the demand for labor uh, to bring down wage, wage inflation. Uh, but uh, the point that I made in the morning briefing today is that um, we're seeing uh, demographic forces uh, having an impact perhaps on the uh, demand side. And I'm uh, once again, being a um, self-centered baby boomer, uh, looking at my own experience and wondering whether 75 million other baby boomers are kind of doing the same thing. Uh, 
we've all gotten older. Uh, kids have, uh, not my kids, but lots of kids have uh, moved. I got five, so f three are out and two are basically still uh, uh, around the house. Um, but um, uh, a lot of the baby boomers uh, are uh, no longer have their kids. Uh, no point in staying home and cooking a meal. The idea of having a, a big meal around the, the table with the family uh, seems to have gone out uh, quite, quite, a, quite a ways ago. Uh, but um, the single population in America is now over 50% of the uh, adult population of 16 years old and over. And you can see it used to be 38% uh, uh, back in the 70s, and now it's uh, 50%. If you look at the breakdown in millions uh, of who they are, the never married uh, are at, uh, have been just increasing like that. And the divorced, separated, and widowed are, are like that. And again, I think uh, single people uh, uh, have a tendency to go out and, uh, and eat either alone or with their friends. Uh, and uh, as a result, we've seen this tremendous surge in um, food services. Uh, maybe uh, during the lockdowns, people sat down and thought about the meaning of life and concluded it's to uh, eat, eat at restaurants more often. Uh, <laughs> whatever it is, uh, you can see that uh, for quite some time, uh, food and beverage uh, stores, what you bought uh, to take home and cook, exceeded uh, what was going on at the restaurants. Uh, then the pandemic hit. We were kind of getting to a crossover point here anyways, and the pandemic may very well have accelerated that. Maybe it was going to happen no matter what. Uh, but uh, as a result of that, uh, we're seeing a, a tremendous demand for uh, em employment and accommodation and food services. <laughs> This is uh, food services and drinking places um, is the, um, the red one. And you can see that uh, even though in current dollars, uh, spending has gone to, uh, uh, to the, through the roof uh, rec record high, uh, we are just basically back to where we were pre-pandemic in terms of em employees. And we know that there's a lot of job openings in, in that area. Um, so I blame the baby boomers for that. Um, it's uh, obvious that as the baby boomers are now in their 60s, 70s, um, that um, they're going to be relying more on health care and social assistance. Let me turn that off. Uh, on health care and social assistance. Um, and uh, so uh, that, that, that employment uh, situation uh, is going to remain quite strong because of the aging of the baby boomers. This one may be cooling off, uh, but it's interesting. When you take transportation and warehousing employment, uh, older people don't like to go to crowded malls and go to uh, crowded supermarkets. Uh, these days, you can order just about anything you want in goods. And so uh, we did see this tremendous surge in warehousing and trucking um, employment well above the uh, pandemic area. And now maybe it's cooling off a bit because people have pivoted away from goods to, uh, to, to services. Well, so far I've only got uh, one question, so I can't imagine that uh, it, that, that I'm uh, covered at all. So let me know if you have any uh, additional uh, questions. But um, the the one I have here is the yield curve is always right! Uh, exclamation mark by anonymous. Um, well, the question is, uh, what is it right about? Uh, again, I it's been my view that the yield curve uh, has been uh, good at predicting a process that when it inverts, investors are saying that uh, I'm willing to buy a bond at a lower yield than I can get on a short-term uh, money market instrument, because I think that uh, at these levels of interest rates, if the Fed continues to raise them, something's going to break. And uh, so uh, short-term rates six months from now, 12 months from now, aren't going to be here. Uh, they're going to be lower. And uh, meanwhile, the bonds might do pretty well in that environment. I think that's exactly what we're seeing here. So um, that part is working out like a charm. And now the financial crisis uh, uh, part of that process is playing out though. Again, let's not, uh, let's not jump to any conclusions here. I mean, I, I know that because of the great experience of the great financial crisis, it's like, oh, we've, we've done this before. We've seen this before. One thing leads to another thing and it's just one bad thing after another. And if SVB isn't Lehman, then something else uh, out there is, is going to be Lehman. So you know, I recognize that's, uh, that's an issue. Uh, 
the yield curve uh, remains inverted. It's putting a squeeze on some financial intermediaries. Um, but you're right. I mean, it does uh, in the past inverted yield curves correctly. We're right about a financial crisis. Got it spreading into a credit crunch and a recession. I should make a, a song out of it because the lyrics are the same. Um, okay, jo Joshua, uh, what would it take for you to change your view of 60-40 soft landing to a more probable hard landing scenario? Uh, well, obviously, uh, Joshua, you, you, you don't agree with me, that's fine. Uh, and uh, I will concede that uh, I have to think about uh, changing the, the, the probabilities. But I'm also trying to factor in the extent to which what the Fed has done um, is, uh, is, isn't going to work. And therefore, uh, we're going to get a recession after all, uh, or actually might, uh, might work um, in terms of uh, stabilizing this particular uh, risk. So um, I guess, uh, you know, when, when you hear me, when I, when, when I can see that point, uh, I'll probably do 40-60. Uh, but uh, that's what makes markets. Uh, Ed, uh, please, uh, this is Veneer. Ed, please talk about the sequence of policy actions during the SNL crisis. Well, I've uh, written a lot of uh, a lot on that, but uh, basically the SNL crisis, uh, and I'll write about it. Maybe that's the best way to convey some of this stuff. Um, but the SNL crisis, uh, uh, basically, there was a lot of corruption at the time, and um, the regulations was really quite lax, partly because of corruption. Uh, some of the uh, SNLs, aggressive ones, uh, increased uh, the amount of uh, rate interest rates that they were willing to pay to uh, att attract deposits. And then they leveraged that, uh, that uh, ex expensive money uh, into uh, mortgages, commercial and uh, residential. And it didn't take, they, get, they became so leveraged uh, that um, when, uh, when that uh, merry-go-round stopped, uh, they uh, suddenly were illiquid and had to be uh, taken over. There was actually something called the Resolution Trust Corporation that was set up to sell, uh, I think it was billions of dollars of, of assets of these uh, SNLs that had gone uh, hog wild with um, uh, the, the, the deregulation. It, it really had a lot to do with financial deregulation because the SNLs uh, prior to that had uh, ceilings on what they could pay on their deposits. And um, whenever interest rates would go up above those ceilings, as I mentioned before, you get this intermediation. Uh, so the SNL industry uh, hired some lobbyists uh, who pushed for legislation to deregulate and get rid of uh, the, the ceilings. Reagan, of course, the Reagan administration was very pro-market and thought this was a good idea. Uh, but I think when it comes to uh, financial institutions, uh, if it's uh, OPM, other people's money, uh, I think it has to be regulated and supervised. Otherwise, they, they will abuse it. Um, okay, uh, Zoom, uh, Zoom user. What effect do you see from the current bank problem on quantitative tightening? That's a good one. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, if, if <clears throat> with quantitative tightening, the Fed obviously is letting um, maturing uh, bonds, uh, all, letting them off the balance sheet. They're not rolling them over into new bonds. And that's having an impact on, um, uh, on the money markets. Uh, I think it's one of the reasons that deposits have been uh, weakening. Um, but uh, what I'm amazed by, and, and kind of confirmed something I learned over the years, is the bond market doesn't seem to be particularly sensitive to supply and demand. It's most sensitive to uh, inflation and what the Fed's going to do about it. Uh, because certainly uh, the um, support for the bond market from the Fed isn't there anymore. Um, I have been pointing out, though, that um, from a supply demand perspective, foreigners have been huge buyers. They bought a trillion dollars worth of uh, bonds in the U.S. over the past year, and that's uh, been an important offset. Uh, and look, at, at higher interest rates, you're going to attract uh, buyers, and the, mar the market works. Uh, let's see. Asset preservation advisors. Uh, thought on the banking system, uh, regional banks. Um, you know, this could possibly uh, lead to a wave of mergers and acquisitions uh, among the, the regional banks. Uh, 
it, uh, it may also lead to uh, an a, a explicit uh, guarantee of, of all deposits. Uh, but the only way that's going to happen is if uh, the government uh, imposes a lot of regulation and supervision on uh, the banking system, particularly the regional banks, who haven't uh, been as tightly managed and supervised as the big money center banks. Now the big mo money center banks seem to be in pretty good uh, shape. So if you're asking me, are regional banks a buy here? I don't know if they're a buy right here, uh, but I think one way or the another, this is going to get resolved either that, you know, confidence has come back uh, with what the Fed's done. And, you know, they don't have to explicitly uh, go and say that all deposits are insured. In some ways, that's the implication of what they just did. If, uh, you know, just make sure that you're in a bank that, uh, that, that matters. Small little dinky bank, they'll probably let it fail. They'll, they'll fire management, and they'll uh, wipe out the investors, and they might very well wipe out depositors that aren't insured. But it all, you know, it all adds up to a moral hazard. We all learned about that in school, that uh, the problem with the government supporting everything and providing all these guarantees is you get moral hazard. Uh, I'll take a couple more questions here. Uh, pr uh, Scott, prior to COVID, demographics was used to explain low inflation, for example, Japan. Was that impression incorrect? Uh, I hope not, because that's uh, one of the points I was making. You might, if you recall my work on the four Ds, the four uh, deflationary forces, uh, one of our accounts uh, uh, sent me an email this morning, uh, also kind of wondering if I was going to uh, chase my odds, raise my odds of a recession. And he kind of viewed everything that's happening as fundamentally deflationary. He likes the bonds, obviously. Um, but um, I think that demographics still matters. The, it's a little complicated though, because uh, aging populations, uh, as we see in Japan, even in China, uh, they're less prone to be inflation, uh, inflationary. On the other hand, uh, when you don't have enough young workers uh, the, and labor uh, supply is, is tight, you might get higher wage inflation. And so there is sort of a debate about which, which is gonna prevail. Maybe it's not one or the other, maybe it's some combination and it's just disinflation and it's not outright deflation attributable to an aging population. Uh, but uh, no, I think the demography still matters. Uh, I think it's just become uh, more of a debatable point because I've been arguing that the aging populations are um, fundamentally deflationary. Uh, and it's only been recently over the past couple of years that demography has kind of had another wrinkle to it, which is what about the labor shortages? Okay, I'll take uh, one more here. Gabby, do you think the Fed made a policy mistake by hiking rates too high, too fast during this cycle? Uh, yeah, um, but um, I think as uh, if they stop here, and they should stop here, uh, and uh, their their game plan was they basically implicitly conceded that they were late to to uh, dealing with uh, with, with uh, inflation. They were behind the curve, and then they scrambled to, uh, to to catch up. And their story along the way was we want to get it up to restrictive, and then we're going to keep it there. If you look at the history of the Fed funds rate. There's very few periods of time where the Fed funds rate goes up and then just goes sideways for a long time. I think there's one or two periods that lasted about six to nine months. So maybe that's what we get uh, th this time around. Uh, and then uh, the economy slowed and inflation slowed and uh, interest rates came down. Uh, I think it's a, a plausible scenario for where we are at right now. So uh, with that, uh, interesting times as always. Uh, thank you for, for tuning in. Have a good week and uh, see you next week.